first of all, I just want to say you know, my my title of my talk is posed as a question because even though climate change is happening, sea level rise is happening, um, the science, uh, climate change science is still in its early stages. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And there's also a lot of uncertainty um, for the factors that could impact this, how fast things happen, um, where they happen. So, so it's really what we're talking about tonight. Um, none of it is a foregone conclusion. I think there's some uh, assumptions we can make. Um, the biggest being that plovers and beach nesting birds and shorebirds in general are going to be impacted by climate change. Um, but we're going to just you know, speculate um, based on a few things and what might happen. So don't get overwhelmed by all the words on the screen. There's not many slides like this, but um, I did want to like start it off with the frame, framing it by a somewhat recent study that was done um, that was in a general sense assessing the vulnerability of shorebirds to climate change in North America. And there was just a few things on this slide I wanted to highlight. Uh, one being that pretty much all the shorebird uh, the breeding in the U.S. and Canada are migratory. So the point there is not only are they going to be um, impacted by climate change um, on the breeding grounds here, but also the wintering grounds, migratory grounds, staging areas. And a really important thing that the ecological synchronicity could be disrupted at multiple sites. So unfortunately, it means we have to worry about them um, in their whole life cycle. Um, and the plover, piping plover is, in fact, the ones that nest here are migratory. And even though we focus on their breeding grounds, they spend more of their time um, migrating and wintering. So there's impacts there. And also, the uh, shorebirds studied in this group, uh, the plover was one of them, uh, piping plover, about 50 species and about 90% of them um, were predicted to experience a risk of extinction due to climate change. And it's just in general, not surprising, based on the results of this study, um, shorebirds are likely to be highly vulnerable to climate change. Now, I would, would like to add to that, though, that I think any sort of investigation of specific species is going to depend on the biology, the ecology of the species. So I, I picked mostly the plover to talk about tonight. I will talk in the second half a little bit um, about some other beach nesting birds. But I think it's really important. You really have to know if you're going to know how a, a particular species is going to be impacted by climate change. You have to know a little bit about the species. So I am I'm going to just talk a little bit about basic biology and um, use of, you know, here on the breeding grounds, at least, of the piping plover. Um, so we're all on the same page, and I don't know where everyone, how much people know. So um, first of all, the piping plover is um, listed our Atlantic coast population. There are three populations, Great Plains, Great Lakes, and the Atlantic coast population that we deal with here. Um, they're listed uh, federally under the Endangered Species Act as threatened. Um, and then states, including New Jersey, they're considered an endangered species. Uh, all told, there's about 8,000 um, individuals, including about 4,000 on the Atlantic coast breeding from the Atlantic um, maritime provinces down to North Carolina. And that 4,000 is simply um, that we have about 2,000 breeding pairs as of last year. New Jersey hovers right around a little over 100. The last eight years or so, it's been about 105 pairs, and as high as 144, and as low as 92 in the last two decades. Um, there's been quite a bit of fluctuation. But unfortunately, we're sort of stuck. We're not, we're not having a, a huge recovery. Um, because we're talking about um, timing and synchronicity with climate change, I just want to give you a real quick overview. Uh, at least on the breeding grounds in New Jersey, the plovers arrive in mid-March. It's um, the males first, the more experienced birds first. Uh, they set up their territories. But birds continue to come in um, as late as early June or June. The first nests are usually laid in April, so we're talking spring, but it's 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 pretty chilly still sometimes. 
peak laying in mid-May, peak hatch in mid-June. First chicks are fledging right around the 4th of July. And then um, by mid-July, we're already seeing birds move back to the wintering grounds or at least to their migratory staging areas. And by in July and August, most of our, our chicks are all fledged and most of our birds have left, although um, more recent studies in the last decade have shown that we do have some plovers um, still around about this time of the year. But there's just this week, there are still some um, at Holgate and up at Sandy Hook. Uh, they're a ground nesting bird, beach nesting bird. They lay lay on the bare ground in sparsely vegetated vegetation, not not in uh, mature dunes. Um, this is because they're relying on their camouflage to be hard to see out in the open. Their eggs are sand colored. The birds are sand colored. And I, I forgot to mention earlier when we were talking about the timing. Timing plovers are very uh, highly fidelic to their breeding sites. So all that means is they do tend to return to the same location year after year, unless something happens. If the habitat's gone, they won't. Um, sometimes there's traumatic events during a season, a predator event, and they'll move to another site. But generally they return to the same site and the same portion of the site, particularly the, of the males. Just a picture of a plover incubating um, its nest. So remember about April, they start laying their first nest. It takes about a month uh, for it to hatch. Uh, if it does fail due to predators, flooding, or other reasons, they will relay um, a, eh, generally two to three times. I guess it can be more than that, but that's what we see here in New Jersey on average. And then um, fall goes well, the chicks hatch um, in about a month, as I said. And then it takes about another month for the chicks to grow um, to the point where they can fly or are fledged. And that, that is our metric we use. We use number of pairs and number of chicks fledged per pairs as our main metric for recovery across the whole Atlantic coast. Eh, just another cute picture. One thing that's important to know about the plover once they hatch, it's different than some of our other species and that'll tie into at least the second half of this talk is um, once they're born, uh, they, they're they not fed by the parents. They generally want to go to the intertidal zone or a wet area to um, feed. Places like in the watershed here, um, near Dr. Stowe, um, the most prominent place is the um, Holgate unit of the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, Refuge, and they can go to the oceanfront side but almost all of the plovers hatched there use the backshore area because of Hurricane Sandy, which we'll talk about, gave them um, back shoreline access. And that's um, a highly productive type of habitat for a piping plover. And these are just some pictures of them feeding and should going from the small chick on the right center and, and in the bottom left, you see the adults. So in 30 days, they grow quite a bit. Okay, so that's just the basic background I wanted to give you for now. Um, so the habitat. The habitat's really important for any climate change talk because um, for piping plover, we really think that the biggest impact is going to be to the habitat itself. And so since I brought up the synchronicity thing, and that's an idea of the timing of when a plover arrives, we don't at this time think that there's going to be a huge impact there, but you know that's one of those unknowns. Things could happen that we can't foresee that could impact them. But I'll give you an example of a shorebird where it could be a much bigger deal. Um, some of you are familiar with the red knots. Um, red knots are also a long, they are a long distance migrant. In the spring, they come from South America um, and stage in the Delaware Bay to feed on horseshoe crab eggs, the refuel go to the Arctic where they nest. They have a very short season there as well to, to breed. And so this is an example of, of a species that um, if there are changes uh, to the, the ecosystem, and one that I could think of is the horseshoe crabs um, only come up uh, during a certain temperature. The, the water temperature has to be a certain temperature warm enough for the, them to come up to spawn. And if that's thrown off, and the knots arrive and there are no eggs to feed on, they're not going to have a good uh, breeding season. 
they're not going to put on enough fat, be able to fly to the Arctic um, breeding grounds, they stay here longer. So everything is really kind. Um, there's a narrow window for change there. So if anything happens to the prey um, or other the habitat that could impact that timing, that is the kind of thing that's really going to impact most of these species. But right now, a plover, you know, their their um, their prey base could could be impacted, and there's other things, as I said, we can't foresee. But right now, it's this habitat, and the habitat that they prefer and do the best in is um, natural inlets. So this is North Brigantine Natural Area, which is also nearby um, Jockey Two Center, just to the south of it. It's one of only two um, inlets in New Jersey that haven't been altered. Uh, so for instance, no bulkheading, um, no jetties. So overwash of this tip is possible. If a bird nests here, it can feed at various places, um, the back shore, or the front. So they tend to do almost twice as well in these kind of habitats. And New Jersey doesn't have very many of those. And then the other one, which is kind of related, is what we call an overwash fan. This is also North Brigantine natural area. Um, and that uh, beach you see was hit by a bunch of small storms that pushed the sand back and created this um, fan where the birds could nest. This is what you're probably more used to seeing in New Jersey. We have um, Avalon in the top left, which is totally um, developed barrier island. We have Wildwood to the right, uh, which has all that um, not only development, uh, but use on the beach and the, the boardwalk, the roller coaster where the beach should be. And then the bottom um, is Asbury Park further north, and we have a boardwalk at the back. And obviously, in these situations, we have no access. The plovers have no access to the back shore, they only have one option. So this is the important thing about the plovers and climate change in, in, in my mind. Plovers actually do well in se under severe storm situations as far as their habitat. They like the open, sparsely vegetated habitat. They like access to the back shore. Um, in New Jersey, they have very little of that because it's so developed, And but even the places they do have it, when we have a storm like Hurricane Sandy, we usually repair, fix the beach. Um, we close up any gaps that could have occurred. Um, even in some areas like Island Beach State Park, where there isn't a lot of infrastructure after Hurricane Sandy, dunes were put back or dune grass was placed to try to fill in the holes. The, one of the few places in New Jersey that didn't happen again was the Ed Edwin B. Foresight National Wildlife Refuge, which is a wilderness area and was left to its own devices after the storm. The picture in the top left is just a couple days after the storm, um, and you can still see it's partially overwashed. And it, the sand was pushed back. Prior, prior to that storm, there was a spine or a line of dunes from uh, the top uh, of the refuge um, that near the um, developed area all the way to the tip. And you can still kind of see in the photo, I know it's a little small, the top half, that entire portion of almost a mile long is still to this day. So um, several since 2012, third winter of that um, 12 and 13, it's still open. And what we see in these situations is Plovers flourish. So prior to Hurricane Sandy, we had about 14 pairs here, and they only fledged 0.21 chicks per pair that, that last year before, which is not enough to sustain the population. The year after, um, and I should point out, there's sometimes a, although plovers are known to respond quickly to habitat changes, um, it's not necessarily quick as in the first year because there's this balance between that um, ability to change quickly, but also they have strong fidelity to the site. So many of the birds that came out the back the first year after Hurricane Sandy kind of went back to the same spots. But over time, um, what did happen is that the 
productivity, the amount of chicks they were producing, increased, doubled, and more than doubled from pre. So you can see in 2014, just a little after Hurricane Sandy, almost two and a half chicks per pair, even though the pairs were about the same at that point. And the simple reason for that was they were starting to find these new storm-created habitats feeding on the back shore when they didn't have that um, access prior to the storm. And what we have is a, a, you know, a ripple effect. The birds come back, including the young, um, either to the site where they were born or close to the site. Um, and so once after 2014, we saw that huge bump in productivity. By the following year, we doubled the number of pairs at the site. And so this is how recovery or this is how plover ecology is supposed to work in a world where we don't have development and kind of controlling after storms. So how does that all fit into climate change? Well, you know, one of the things we hear a lot about is storms and how, you know, storm, there's going to be more storms or there's going to be more severe storms as a result of climate change. And I did um, just a couple days ago, I was reading in the New York Times, they haven't determined that the frequency of storms has actually increased um, recently, although that's a little hard to believe if you've looked at a hurricane map uh, in the last couple of weeks, there's a lot of them out there, but looking at the big picture over a lot of years, but uh, what they are noting already is a greater intensity of the storms, and you may have heard, heard that. So this is the tricky part. More storms and possibly even more severe storms could be good for piping plovers if it creates more and better habitat. But there's a lot of ifs. There's first of all, there's probably a tipping point. Um, it, and where that is, we don't know. So it could be for the short term or medium long time. If more habitat was created, that could be actually a good thing for a shorebird like a piping plover. But if sea level rise continues um, to, to occur and it occurs rapidly, it could offset those gains. So that's, again, another question mark. But I think a lot of people find it surprising that it's possible that there could be an upside to more storms for uh, piping plovers. I'll just, um, just because the refuge is close to the Jacques Cousteau and it's in their backyard and it's an important spot, I want to point out um, not only did the pairs double after Hurricane Sandy, we had a little bit of a drop um, in 2018 in particular, and that's because the there wasn't as much productivity um, at the site for that one year. Um, but we've gotten the productivity back up, and we're now back up to almost 30 pairs. And we had a very good year at Holgate this year for um, reproductive success. So given that, we will likely see another um, increase. I will just throw in here, New Jersey in the last eight years or so has been hovering at 105 pairs, and it's, it'll go up down to 90. It went down to 92. It's gone up to 115 pairs. A lot of back and forth. We have had good repro reproductive success, so we should be seeing bigger gains. But remember, we were talking about wintering grounds and migratory areas, and we we have hurricanes happening on the wintering grounds. And this is why, again, I'm only talking. I was talking about storms being good for the habitat. They're not good for mortality. If uh, if um, Piping plover, for instance, last year there was a uh, hurricane in the Bahamas, Dorian, uh, and a lot of our plovers winter, a large, the largest percentage winter in the Bahamas. So hurricanes, severe hurricanes, and that was a severe one, do have the possible impact of causing mortality on the wintering ground or um, migration. That particular hurricane hit the Bahamas, and then it came up to the U.S., and it hit the around um, Hatteras near Ocracoke, I believe, which happens to be one of the most important staging, migratory staging ground for piping plover. So they potentially took a double hit during that storm. Okay. So I talked about the tipping point, and this is just illustrating that. 
even though more storms could create better habitat long term for a plover or at least mid term, short term, if those storms are more severe and occur during the breeding season, uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. So they, they plovers thrive on low lying habitat, it's a high risk for them. So more storms during the actual breeding season, spring and summer when they're laying eggs will mean they'll lose eggs. It's, it's a little hard to know um, that, you know, weather is local. It's not the same as climate change. And there's so many factors. Um, for the last several years, not including this year, actually, um, flooding was not a big problem for piping plovers in New Jersey, at least on the breeding grounds. Predators are the big issue. Um, but this year we did see some more um, flooding. We had uh, two tropical storms during the breeding season uh, that, that impacted it more. So, so again, a lot of questions and unknowns, but I just wanted to point out some of the things that we're looking at that could impact the, the birds. And again, storms could be good, they could be bad, depends on the timing, it depends on how severe. Okay, so here's my other other wordy slide. I, I'd say there wouldn't be too many. Um, so I just wanted to point out, even though uh, climate change science is, is is relatively new, there have been some studies out there in the last decade or so. I'm not going to get in them or do a deep dive, but I did want to point out that there's in particular uh, folks at the USGS um, have been conducting research um, to identify the coastal habitats for species of concern, including piping plovers, under a, a variety of sea level rise scenarios. And so they're using um, models to try to predict what the impact was. And I only put this slide on the bottom to kind of like reinforce this idea. There's so many factors that it, it, it's why it's so hard to exactly predict what's going to happen. You can see in each of the uh, ovals or circles at the bottom are the factors that they used for shoreline change, barrier island, and the actual plover habitat to try to determine which ones um, they, they change, if they change them, what might happen. So and that's one thing that's great about modeling is you can change the factors around that kind of test what, what would happen. And you can also change um, predictions of if the sea level rises X amount or Y and see what the differences are. So I didn't realize this. Um, well, I did, but I didn't know when I was doing the study, but this is uh, apparently NJDP. Is, this is their climate week 2020. And um, so one of the things I wanted to point out is sea level rise isn't the same everywhere, of course. Um, but this slide would suggest that they're rising at a greater rate in New Jersey than other parts of the world. And I have seen a number of um, models that show that the new, not just New Jersey, but the New York, New Jersey area um, is one of the worst areas predicted. So. Um, that's one thing. And secondly, they were trying to put some numbers to that. Um, they're saying without action, sea level rise in New Jersey could reach five, a little over five feet in the year 2100. Um, so 100 years compared to 2000 and up a foot in 2030 and two feet in 2050. So rises of this nature are going to have a huge impact on a ground nesting beach nesting bird. So part of what happens and how fast is going to be how how fast that does happen. And I wanted to point out that's an important thing. Um, one reason the plover is a little bit different than, say, um, an oyster catcher, which I'm going to talk about a little um, after we have our questions. The plover lives, let's say, approximately seven years on average, um, which is not a, a super long time. And if we start getting sea level rise happening at a very fast pace or intense storms continually over a short, you know, several years. And they have several years in a row or multiple years of very low reproductive success. They're not going to survive. So if they have 100 years to maybe adapt a little or we have a chance to come up with 
solutions in that time, it's not a death sentence for the species necessarily, but it, it's going to come down at the rate that these things happen, not just that they're happening. Of course, if we really get five feet up and we don't do anything, all our um, barrier islands are going to be covered with water. So um, I'm not sure there's a scenario there where plovers are going to survive, but we'll see. Um, we don't know how we're going to deal with this, but we need to deal with it. So a couple things, a couple potential we'll calm solutions. Um, so we know that in New Jersey, or you should know that we are one of the most highly subject to nature and nourishment for one of the longest periods of time of any state. And so, you know, this is one way that we're dealing with it. Um, but as the seas are rising quicker, uh, we, we have the question of, is this a sustainable method? For now it is, but you, you already know, if you know anything about re beach renourishment, they have to happen pretty frequently in, in large sections of, the, of our coast to stay maintained. They're overbuilt, they're built to, to be eroded back over time, but still um, there are certain parts of our barrier islands on Long Beach Island at the southern end right before Holgate, um, the, the wildlife refuge portion where it erodes very quickly after nourishment. So this is one potential solution, putting more sand there, building the sand up. I will point out that um, one of the impacts of these beach projects have been plovers in locations we didn't have previously or in, in sort of last 50 years. As a result, we have new places, particularly Monmouth County, uh, the area is Monmouth Beach and Seabright south of Sandy Hook. But generally speaking, plovers have not done, uh, have been as productive on these kind of beaches. So they could just be population sinks. We have short periods where the plovers do do well and survive and then, um, but usually not sustained over a long period of time. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It could be uh, related to they're not as productive for foraging and we know that they're, they tend to be, they are for storm protection um, and they're usually on developed beaches, on developed barrier islands. And so again, there's no access at these sites um, for plovers on the back shore. So they just don't generally do well, and it also brings more people to the beach. Um, and they do not do well in general in situations where they're highly disturbed by humans. Kind of, um, I'm just gonna do a time check. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the other possibilities is a habitat restoration that's a little bit more focused on the needs of piping plovers. And, Granted, uh, we don't have a lot of places or at least a lot, a lot of places in New Jersey we can do it on a scale that's going to help us really impact recovery, but we can try it. And in fact, the last two um, winters, myself, Rutgers, Dr. Maslow at Rutgers University and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Army Corps of Engineers, and the state DP endangered and non-game species program. We've been partnering with um, Brooke and I as the lead to do a restoration project at Barnegat Light. Um, going back uh, three decades or, or more than that at this point, this is what Barnegat Light used to look like. Um, it was a spit. It did not have that jetty, the inlet jetty. So um, people may not have ever seen Barnegat Light looking like this. Um, and at this time, there were about a dozen uh, plovers that nested at the site. Again, another kind of uh, type of habitat where the birds have access to the back shore, the front shore. Um, it's sparsely vegetated. This is perfect plover habitat. Then the jetty was put in um, in, the, in the mid 1990s. Even once it was initially completed, there was this vast area of um, no dunes. There were the top near the lighthouse and then kind of out by the shoreline, you can see some ponds. There was these ephemeral pools and ponds where the, the plovers could feed. There were skimmer colonies and terns that nested here. So this remained a really good site for a long time, but it is a highly stabilized environment with that jetty. And what happened um, just a couple of winters ago, um, this is what it looked like. 
it was partially a maritime forest and most of the rest of it was um, a late succession dune, uh, highly vegetated, very little open area for plovers. In fact, there were down to one plover nesting at the site. So it wasn't rock science actually. Um, but what we did is we we did a project where we were trying to take it back uh, to the early successional stage. So two winters ago, we began clearing um, the area of the dunes. This is a, a more dramatic area. Uh, the project area is 42 acres. We haven't uh, restored all of that, uh, but about three quarters of it so far. Um, another view to give you a, a sense. And this past winter, I didn't put more pictures in from this past winter, but we, we went back to almost to the lighthouse and we built a really large pond back there for foraging. Whoops, I'm gonna skip back. You can barely see it, but we, we do have a small pond um, in this on this slide too. I'll, I'll show it in a second. You can kind of see it in the background here. So we have two ponds on the site for plovers to forage in. We put some shell substrate down. We got rid of the vegetation. I will um, say that um, even though it took two years to build, it's going to take a lot of years to maintain the vegetation um, because it's so stabilized there. We are trying to mimic an overwash condition, but because there's a jetty and it's stable, the water does not come up and self kind of like regulate it, keep the um, vegetation thin and the dunes down. So it's, it's a long-term project. Uh, there's the pond, I'm sorry, you can kind of see. And at the bottom right, uh, just to the left, uh, the dark area is now a much larger pond. I'm happy to report that, you know, we're only up to two and a half pairs. The pairs did really well. They, just like at Holgi, um, right after Sandy, they've doubled their reproductive success. And we did have um, other birds prospecting there as well this year. So we and remember at Holgate, I explained it takes a year or two um, for the birds to kind of um, get recruited into these new sites. So next year is a really important year. If we can keep the site in good condition and we, we know we had other birds prospecting, we hope to see sort of a, a more dramatic bounce in the number of birds using this area. So this is just another example um, of carefully planned um, restoration project could be another way to address some of the um, impacts of climate change on the habitat. Um, again, um, it's not perfect because you can't do it everywhere. It's not as expensive as a beach renourishment project, um, but it's also not not um, without costs. And that's one of our plovers there at the Barnegat Light. So um, I think this would be a good place uh, for us to take a few questions, um, if there are any, Caitlin, and then I'll move on to some other species. Uh, Todd, I have questions in the chat box right now. Um, maybe I'll give it a, a couple of seconds. If, if someone does have a question, they can pop it in really quick. If not, we will keep moving on. Okay. the chat up so I can see them coming in. Do you take a lot of the photos yourself? Um, I took a lot of the, yes, I do, but not this particular one. And um, as far as the restoration site, uh, Ben Worst, who works for Conserve Wildlife, um, got a drone out and took some pictures for us, and then DP um, did as well. And I'll just Mention as a side while we're waiting, um, if you are interested in the habitat restoration project, there is a nice video that the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife just released on YouTube. If you just type in Barnegat Light Habitat Restoration, it'll it'll pop up as interviews um, and some really cool footage of the project. It's a little more in-depth explanation. Uh, I have a little interview in there too. Oh, cool. okay. Uh, so we do have one question from Christine. Uh, are you keeping foot traffic out of the Barnegat Light area? Yes. So um, the I should point out that the habitat restoration took place approximately where there were 
you know, birds before, and they were being, it was being fenced off by New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife um, long term. The area has expanded, so it's more. And um, the state did ask us to keep the fence up longer than we would normally. Normally, when we have that kind of fence, we take it down once the nesting's over. But because the pond is there, just from a safety factor, um, they asked that we kind of leave the fence up a little longer. So um, it'll be up through October at least, but yes, short answer is yes. Um, yeah, uh, can I add one more thing to that? I, I guess, you know, that's the thing I don't have time because it was a little side thing. I also have a full presentation on that. Um, the goal of that project um, was not only to create more and better habitat, but prior to that, the birds, once they hatch, they would leave the fenced areas to feed on the pools along the jetty or the ocean front, which are highly traffic trafficked by people. So the goal of that was to build the foraging areas inside the fence. And that's this year, um, all the chicks that were born use the um, inside foraging areas. They never left uh, to forage that we ever observed until they were old enough to fly. Um, so that was uh, the goal. And it wasn't in my wildest imagination that they would never leave it. Um, but they exclusively use those ponds um, to feed. So that that's probably why we had such good um, chick success there. Great. Great. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, there's no other questions for you, Chad. So um, I think it, uh, you can uh, keep on going if you'd like. Okay, we will do. Okay, so um, we're gonna shift gears a little bit, um, talk about a couple other species. Um, oyster catcher, another um, bird that's very, uh, you know, prevalent, at least in this watershed here of Jacques Cousteau, really across the whole state. And one of the things that's a little bit different about them is they nest both on the um, Barrier Island beaches, but also um, in the marsh, marsh islands. They're more plastic, they're more uh, flexible in where they'll nest. So um, I think there's a pair that nests uh, right near the Rutgers North Field Station. So they're all, you know, you should should see them around in the summer and spring. Um, some of the things about them are very similar to plovers. Um, obviously, they're ground nesters. Um, they do, however, feed their chicks, um, at least until the, in the early stages. It isn't until they're much older that they begin to feed on their own. And um, this is another case where this kind of ecology or biology of the birds is important um, in certain scenarios for climate change or just what I'm going to talk about next. And what that is, is right here in Atlantic City, um, we now have oyster catchers that are nesting on rooftops. So this is, I can't remember what casino this is, um, but in the, on the left side, it's a little hard to see, but that little sandy grass uh, spot that um, formed on the roof is where there's a nest and you can see the, um, the, the, the mate is on the ledge there looking down on the regular beach. And uh, that that other one was being on the bottom right. When we went up on the roof, uh, they were being protective. The bird came running out at us. So rooftop nesting is not a new thing. Um, in Florida, something like 75% or more of their, some of their tern species, uh, least terns nest on rooftops. And so I just want to make a point here. I, I'm not saying um, unequivocally that they're nesting up here because of sea level rise. There are some other factors. Um, for instance, in Florida, the beaches are so heavily used um, that it, it becomes a, you know, there's not a lot of habitat to use. But also um, in Atlantic City here, the beach is very narrow. Um, we do know, however, that this is an area in particular where there's a lot of sea level rise um, happening. Uh, we have a, a pair that one of our volunteers was monitoring on the back shore that for many years nested um, on the bay side. Um, and then over time, she noticed it disappeared. And then lo and behold, the, um, there was a uh, supermarket right across the street. And she noticed that the bird was up on the roof and connected the dots. And she was actually the first one that um, noted that oyster catchers were nesting um, in New Jersey on rooftops. And it's not just an isolated in Atlantic City, Margate, Longport. So it's just in that area. 
And again, not saying it's entirely because of sea level rise, but it is possible it's because of that. And even if it isn't possible, this is um, something that could happen more and more with a species that's a, able to do that, such as an oyster catcher. Again, a plover could never, I, I hate saying never, but isn't going to nest on a rooftop because once the chicks hatch, they have to go to the shoreline to feed. Remember, this is again, the, the oyster catchers bring food back to the young, at least initially. So um, that's that makes this possible for them to hatch. And in fact, um, some of the uh, chicks that have hatched on these roofs are successfully um, fledging. But it's not just um, there, but it's just an odd site. Here's a couple of the boardwalk. I, I guess the oyster catcher likes fudge down there on the bottom left. They, that one almost went into that storefront when I was there um, observing it. Um, and I just wanted to point out, um, I did not, everyone insists I put that card um, Atlantic City site. That was, um, that's a sliding glass door from a room. So at one point there used, these rooms were used, they weren't being used um, at this point, but um, there was all kinds of stuff out on the roof. But this is a goal that's nesting here. And there are a few um, other places where goals are nesting on roofs as well. Um, so this is a goal. But you can see this is the old, I believe the former Trump um, property, and it's really hard to see, but if you look up on that ledge, there's an oyster catcher. Here's another one on another roof as I was walking down. So, so they're up there and I, I pointed out um, lease turns. We do not have any confirmation of lease turns nesting on rooftops in New Jersey, but in Florida and this sign is from them. I mean, they have a whole separate, it's so prevalent that they have a whole separate program four turns, their, their rooftop nesting, special sets of signs, and they tend to nest on roofs. They have a whole protection program so that the chicks don't fall off of the side of the roof. Um, so this could possibly be something we see in our future here in New Jersey too, but you have to, for the lease turns for this to happen, and again, lease turns um, bring food back to the young, so it would be possible, and then they would fly, wait until they're fledged to fly off the roofs. I will say that it looks like the oyster catchers are jump, jumping off the roof prior in some cases to when they can um, fly. So this adds a whole whole nother level of survival issues for them if they're jumping off a roof onto a boardwalk and then have to get to a beach or some area where eventually where they can feed on their own um, once they're old. So it's it, it's not it's a messy scenario, I guess, but it it's something we're looking at um it may be that the reason this is only happening um in new jersey mostly in the atlantic city areas because maybe that's the only place in the coastal zone where there are the type of roofs that this could happen for at least turn to, to nest though um on a roof they would need a gravel surface and there there are less and less um gravel roofs even in florida they're getting rid of them and having other kinds of flat industrial roofs so it may be a short term. We may not see it 50 years from now if they get rid of the gravel on the roofs as well. Um, and I just put this slide up to reinforce the idea that the turns feed their chicks. So that's why this um, rooftop nesting could, could be possible. I do remember um, when I first started working um, 25 to 30 years ago on this project, uh, there was talk that there was least turns nesting on rooftops up in the Hudson River area, Jersey City. Uh, we tried to go up and confirm it. We never confirmed it 100 percent, but um, <laughs> those industrial roofs there were so large and we didn't have the ability to see on top of the roofs what was happening. Um, I will say we were um, thankful that the casinos did let us in. Um, this is pre-COVID uh, previous years to check on those oyster catchers on those roofs. That said, we're not studying them um, super closely, so I can't give you any detailed information um, on their productivity. There is a, if you're really interested in it and you Google it, there is a short paper um, out there about it um, from one of the monitors that uh, wrote something up. And then I just wanna go back to this idea of, um, impacts on prey species and diet. So 
you know, I'm not sure about the clovers. That's again, I don't feel strongly at this time that there's going to be an impact in the short term. But I, I do think this is a real issue we have to think about for both fish eating species like least terns and um, perhaps for oyster catchers that are eating mussels and clams. I, I do think changes in sea level rise, but also temperature are going to impact their prey base, and that's ultimately going to impact their survival on how it goes. Um, you know, this is happening with various species. Um, you know, for least terns in New Jersey, we focus a lot on what happens on the breeding ground as far as predators destroying eggs and breeding success. But uh, about a decade ago, I went to a least tern uh, meeting in California. And there I found, you know, they, they were specialized, their research was primarily focused on prey species and they found um, that the availability of and the type of prey available um, had a bigger impact in many cases on how successful the breeding season was. So for instance, if uh, species, small uh, fish species were not near shore and the terns had to fly offshore further, um, it took more time to bring food back. They tended to do more poorly than when um, there was prey available close by. And we, 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 there are studies that suggest the same um, for oyster catchers and other species. But here in New Jersey, we don't study that. Uh, we haven't to date studied that really closely. So we don't have a lot of data about that, but I think it, it makes sense that these are things that we need to worry about. Another example would be the puffins in uh, Maine who've had this remarkable, well-documented um, recovery um, and reintroduction there. And, you know, some recent years, they started to do very poorly because the prey fish are changing because uh, the Bay of Maine, Maine, Gulf of Maine, excuse me, is what was warming up and, and, the, and the available um, species was changing quickly year to year. Uh, I remember one year there was only one species that was too large and spiny for the young to eat. And even though adults were bringing food back to the young, um, they were starving because they couldn't eat, eat it. So again, I, I hate to keep saying a lot of unknowns, but these are, they're at least unknowns that we have an idea what we're looking for. At. And then we're back to the impacts on migratory and wintering habitat. And I've already alluded to this and talked about it, but um, I put up this picture. Um, so one of the things that's cool about American oyster catchers in New Jersey is not only do we have breeders and migrants, but we also have a wintering population. Other than one small group of them in the Jones Beach area or a little north of there in Long Island, um, we are more or less the northernmost uh, at the northernmost range for the wintering oyster catcher, at least a significant number. And the um, Biggest uh, winter roost is typically at um, the south end of Brigantine. Uh, that's the Casino Harris right across the way, right at the bridge there. It can be anywhere from four to 600 birds at this site in the winter, which is a really spectacular site. And from um, bands, we know it's a mix of birds that breed north of us, some overwintering from New Jersey. Um, but again, um, these areas could disappear. They need an area where they can, a safe area to, to go um, at high tide. So what happens is during low tide, they all fan out even in the winter individually or in small groups to um, forage. And then once um, the shellfish beds are covered over, they find a safe play, place um, to rest as a group. And um, this particular site does have ORV usage. Um, it's as the winter goes on, it's it's not as severe as the summer, um, so they're often here. But if not, they go to that little um, brown spit you see right across the way. But that's particularly low lying, and and that is an area that will probably be covered over time. I would say in the next decade or two. And so then the question is, where do the birds go um, if they only have this one spot? Let's say let's say that beach still um, doesn't overwash, but if there's vehicles on it. So these are the things that start impacting the birds in ways, again, that um, we're not entirely sure what it's going to mean, but 
constant disturbance um, on these shorebirds in the winter um, makes them less fit long term. One of the things that um, I mentioned about oyster catchers being different um, or alluded to with the Clover Talk is they do live longer. Um, there's been examples of up to 30 years from the banded individuals. So they will have the ability to maybe adapt an individual um, oyster catcher. So they have a little bit more time to make changes. And um, also, I already previously mentioned they're more uh, plastic in where they'll choose the nest. So, you know, they will nest in alternative habitat, whereas the plovers are pretty much specialists and at least till now only nest on the Atlantic Coast beaches in New Jersey. So, again, these are the things you need to start looking at to evaluate what the impacts are going to be um, on our various uh, beach nesting and coastal shorebirds. And I think I timed out. Um, I went a little fast in, in certain spots, but I did want to leave a few more minutes in case um, anyone did come up with some questions. So I don't know, Caitlin, you want to see if anybody has anything? Sure, thanks, Scott. That was, it's, um, the, it's really interesting, the nesting on all the buildings. <laughs> yeah. Do, do the is the sand already up on the rooftops from wind and it just kind of creates a little sandy area and they just sort of build from there. Yeah, and, and in those cases, um, all the cases, it's just these little patches. So, you know, it's it's very opportunistic. It's not a large scale, you know, thing that's going to happen. But um, yeah, just sand blowing up there and in that case, some veg. It was up there for a couple of years and seeds and vegetation grew. So um, unfortunately, that same rooftop had a lot of gulls on it as well, nesting. So um, gulls can be a predator for oyster catchers, both their chicks and their eggs. So depending on the situation, it, it, it's not ideal, um, but they are coexisting in some of those cases. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. All right, so yeah, if anyone has any additional questions uh, for Todd, just put them in uh, the chat box. Um, Doc, to answer your question, yes, this recording will be able to be accessed on our YouTube channel um, after we're all done. So maybe in like the next week or so, we'll be able to have this up. Um, question from Rhonda, what are the biggest predators of clovers and other shorebirds? Well, at least for our beach nesting birds, um, it can vary from site to site. In general, in New Jersey, one of our biggest is um, red fox on the mammalian side, but we also have raccoons, um, feral cats can be an issue in some locations, but fox comes to the top usually. Um, a relatively newer one or a more prevalent one now is coyote. Um, they've been in Cape May County for quite a while, but they're making their way up. Um, we did hear and see them at um, Barnegat Light, for instance. So, so they're they're getting more prevalent. Um, and then on the avian side, it can be gulls of all the gull species, um, but particularly bad when they're present are crows. Um, in part because they're so smart. You saw the picture of that cage under the water. I didn't really get into a lot of um, discussion about that. That's the predator cage that we put over some, but not all plover nests. Um, and that helps protect the nest um, wh while it's being incubated so it can hatch and not be attacked by predators or at least large ones. But crows are particularly bad in the sense that they do realize there's birds in there. And if they've been taught also, they know there's going to be chicks and so they'll, keep landing on the predator cage and they will grab the chicks as they leave once they hatch. So that predator cage does not really work um, necessarily where we have a crow problem. In fact, it can pretty much put a, you know, a dot, an X on the back of the plover and say, here, here's going to be your meal um, eventually. So it, it's tricky. That's the management of predators is, is tricky, but um, so the cages is one of the things we do to try to, I'll fox them literally. <laughs> That's amazing that we're uh, able to figure that out. Oh, hold on. We got 
Another one coming in. Um, when do these birds leave the area for winter and when can we expect to see them back? Okay, so yeah, I touched on this briefly and um, it's not like, um, so like with the red knots, they all come like say to the Delaware Bay in a, in a really narrow couple week window in late May and early June. For plovers, it, it's it's a little bit, uh, it's spread out over time, but we get the first ones back in March, and I would say about mid-March is when we really start seeing them, although we do have a, a record. It's a big honor to get the first sighting of a plover in the spring, and or winter in this case, um, occasionally the end of February, but um, most of them arrive between March, mid-March, and mid to late April. And then um, they really leave as soon as the breeding season's over, and that can be uh, first of July. If they don't lay eggs by the beginning of July or the end of June, I would say, um, actually, um, they're done for the season. So we do see birds start leaving, and we see migrants coming through first week of July. Um, most of them are leaving a little, the majority leave a little after that, and most are gone by mid to late August. But as I mentioned earlier, um, we do still have plovers here in New Jersey at a few locations, including a few of our breeders, but not many left. All right, uh, a couple of other questions. Uh, what can a regular person do to help plovers? That's a good question, Rhonda. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the scenarios differ a little. So at the Edwin B. Foresight Natural Wildlife Refuge, it's closed to the public. So um, it, the main thing you can do is if you're on a beach where there are plovers, and that's not the case there, although we do ask that at Holgate, you make sure you honor the boundary line. Um, but um, just respect those fenced areas. Don't cut through um, if you see a plover. Uh, you know, give it a lot of space. Don't linger, especially if you see it um, being active or a broken wing or pretending it has a broken wing or being alarmed. You, that means there's chicks or a nest nearby and you want to just walk by it quickly or move out of the area. And then really important, and this is the one not everyone likes to hear, but um, dogs are a problem. Uh, plovers view those dogs as um, a predator like a fox or a coyote now. Um, even when they're on the leash, they react, they'll leave their nest area, they'll leave, move away from incubating their nest. So not only does that put the eggs at risk, but if they move away and there's a crow in the area, for instance, and the crow saw them leave the nest, it'll go over and check it out. And that this is when predator events could happen that we're triggering as humans. So um, the dog part, keep your dogs off the beach where there's plovers or nesting areas is super important. Is that why you see like signs when you, you know, rules about the beach, um, probably no dogs allowed, probably that might be one of the reasons why? It is one of the reasons, um, although um, sometimes people are like, oh, there's darn plovers, can't take my dog on the beach. But the truth is almost every municipality in New Jersey, unless they have a small designated area for dogs on the beach, don't allow um, uh, dogs either um, because uh, of safety and health reasons as well, but it's a combination of all that. Yeah, I know there are some designated areas for that specifically to take your pet, so that's that's good. Um, yep. Kind of a side question to that. Um, do you see a lot of marine debris um, affecting plovers and beach nesting shorebirds? We do. Um, and in particular, it seems like certain species are more prone. It seems like oyster catchers in particular. Um, one of the reasons that could be is uh, the, the oyster catchers are going on jetties to pull off mussels or pull off clams from a substrate there. And, you know, some of those are places where people are fishing and they're leaving fishing line, um, whether just dropping it or accidentally. Um, and so we're seeing fishing line entanglements, but we are seeing other debris as well. Um, we saw several plovers get their legs um, caught in things this year, more so than normal. Um, I don't know that it, it's, there's a trend for plovers per se, but um, we definitely, oyster catchers in particular, seem prone, prone to um, fishing line and debris like that. So yeah, if you're a fisher person, Make sure you don't leave any debris, or even better, if you see some where you are on the beach, please pick it up, um, take it with you. Absolutely, yeah. 
Um, we do have one final question, at least I don't see any other questions. So we'll, with, due to time, we'll probably uh, make it our final question. And that's from Emily. Um, are there any other candidate sites for habitat restoration on the New Jersey coast? Well, um, a couple, yes. Um, some of them that are more smaller scale than the Barnegat Light one. Um, and also there are two places where habitat restorations already occurred. One was the Cape May Meadows um, quite a few years ago. It was hugely successful, but it, it had a shelf life. Um, it, it, it did not have um, this idea of maintaining as much built into the planning. And so over time, it didn't become uh, as suitable. But uh, as early as this winter, um, they're going to revisit that site and try to kind of lower the elevation a little, take some of the sand and the vegetation away. So using the basic idea we used to burn and get light um, and recycle that sand elsewhere where it's needed. Um, and then uh, secondly, potentially Stone Harbor Point, which already had a few habitat restorations, which varying degrees of success and for different species, um, but right now, the plovers there are on a very low ebb. In particular, I should note that the Barnegat Bay Estuary is at, at a peak in New Jersey for a long time for um, piping plovers, whereas Cape May County in that area used to be a really important spot. And there's only a, just a handful, I think five, four or five, four or five um, pairs nested in all of Cape May County. This year. so. Uh, Stone Harbor Point, again, might in the next uh, couple years be a place we look at again for a habitat restoration. And there's, it's bigger there. Um, so something we could possibly do on a large scale. All right, great. Uh, okay, so I guess we're going to call it here. And um, a lot of great questions. And thank you, Todd, again, for taking time uh, out of your evening to chat with us. Um, if you do have any other questions about our programs, um, any questions that you want me to maybe you didn't get to that you want to relate to Todd, I'm going to put my email uh, in our chat box here. If I can. Can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> So there you go. There's my email. Um, also, if you guys want to get on our email list and see what other upcoming programs we got, um, or just any questions in general about what uh, we've got going on, just uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, so thank you so much, Todd, again, and uh, great work uh, with all you do with the, the plovers and other beach nesting birds along our shores. Okay, thanks. And thanks for having me. And thanks, everyone, for um, coming on, to, on board tonight to listen. Yep, absolutely. All right, everybody. Well, have a good night and we'll see you soon. We'll, uh, we'll end our session. Thank you. <laughs>